We all recognize that we're living in a very permissive age. It has become the rule of the way our culture and society lives. It is a very worldly state of affairs in so far as the land in which we live. Granted, these things have come from time to time through history. We can read of it as far as the nations that are mentioned in the Bible. But in our times in the United States, since its existence, I doubt we have seen as much lewdness and lasciviousness in this permissive age as we are now experiencing and is becoming a, an accepted part of the way we live. Now the church is in the middle of all of this, still expected by God to be all the New Testament says it ought to be. Each one of us must be, if heaven will be our home, what God says Christians and all of that word is defined and to mean uh, will be there if we're going to be what that means. But you hear people, maybe they don't just come out and say it, many will, but they certainly indicate it by the things they do, is that, well, you must accept people as they are. Well, now, we must accept people as they are from the standpoint of meeting them where they are to teach them the gospel. But we dare not accept them as the way things ought to be in people's lives. You hear all the time, don't rock the boat when people denounce evil as the Bible defines evil or expose false doctrine over and against the true doctrine of Jesus Christ found in the New Testament. Just let people be as they want to be and just love them and smile and back them up and help them when they hurt and don't be judgmental and who are you to do that? We're all at various stages of a work in progress and all that kind of thing. And all that does is pretty well let people do what they want to do regardless of what the Bible teaches and think that God's happy with them. Well, I can't think of a better gospel of the devil than that. It just cannot be. In fact, if we must accept people as they are, the way I pointed it out here in our permissive society, Jesus Christ would never left heaven, come to earth to do what he did, to be tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, without breaking God's law. Why would he? There's nothing to change in people. Everybody just kindly deals with one another. But then they define kindly. And man becomes a measure of what's right and wrong to himself. Man becomes the measure of all things. Christ did not seek to become adjusted, nor to accept people as they were then. And his spiritual body, which is the church, is not to do so either. God's men of the Old Testament didn't accept them as they were. That is, the people of their day. The great man and the great faithful Noah did not accept people as they were in his generation. The writer of Hebrews writing the New Testament to encourage Christians to be what they ought to be in their permissive, decadent society, had this to say to them that their faith would be as God wanted it to be, formed by the Word of God and strengthened by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And there you find by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Now listen to him. By the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Again, that's Hebrews 11 and verse 7. When we obey the truth, 
in the face of all manner of persecution and adversity. We continue to defend the faith and contend for it. Then realize as we live according to the authority of Jesus Christ, we are condemning the world as Noah did. That preacher of righteousness could have very well had some critics who were carping because he preached it too straight. Well, if our godly behavior and fearless proclamation of God's truth does not condemn the world today, then something is lacking in your life and my life. Because righteous Noah, and that was written aforetime for our learning, Romans 15, 4, by his obedience, <laughs> condemned the world. Do you realize that the world is condemned already because the world's in sin and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? And if there was no saving gospel because there was no Savior, then there's nothing but to be destroyed eternally in the devil's hell for everybody. Lot, the nephew of Abraham, didn't accept people as they were in his time. For this reason, God, so Peter wrote, remember he wrote to Christians about this Old Testament happening, God delivered just Lot, a man of justice. What was the state of Lot's mind when he was living in that mess? It says he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Now, filthy conversation, as it's used in the King James Version, doesn't mean the words he used. Conversation means he was irritated to no end. He was vexed at the ungodly living they were doing, at their actions. You know, there's something wrong with us as the church collectively and as individual Christians. If the world doesn't vex us, doesn't upset us, and people... Don't move us to want to teach them the way of righteousness. I'm sure some shallow, pretentious, so-called do-gooders now seek acceptance of the filthy sins which led to the utter destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot was spared because he was righteous. But his associates perished in their ungodly, filthy behavior. They were not accepted. They were not accepted by Lot, and certainly not by God's Lot, uh, Lot's God. And the filthy behavior by degenerates in our day must not be condoned. They should not feel comfortable around faithful children of God, and we should not let them feel comfortable in their mess. The problem is we've learned to kind of make peace. If we see that kind of stuff going on, then we sort of want to just sidle around it and not say, hey, that's not right. But then how are we to be the light of the world? And how are we to be the leavening for good if we don't actually deal with these people's beliefs and conduct? You don't have to have a pulpit like that and a thousand people out there hungry and thirsting after righteousness before you could preach the truth. The greatest pulpits members of the church have is right where they live, or on the job, or in the school, or among their own family. Now, there's a price you may have to pay. People may not accept the truth you point out to them about their conduct. But that's just a price we have to pay. Do you remember that our Lord said, Take up your cross daily and follow me? He didn't say, take up your lily daily and follow me. He didn't say, take up your feather duster daily and follow me. <coughs> There's a cross to bear. And when you think of the cross the Roman Empire thought of, it's not a pleasant thing at all. But it goes along with the territory on the road to heaven. God's prophets of the Old Testament didn't accept people just the way they were. The great and faithful, fearless prophet Elijah just wasn't quite ready to accept a bunch of false teachers in his day. 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 40. After 
450 false prophets were slain. There could have been a few here and there who could have criticized the prophet Elijah for not having the proper love and understanding and go along to get along attitude, true of ecumenism. But he was not about to accept them as they were, and we've known that in the Bible all along. It was written before time for our learning. But what do we do about it? About as much as this, but in a lot of churches of Christ, that's not even being done. We cannot, as he did not, accept false teachers, for God does not. Listen to the great faithful prophet Isaiah. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8 and verse 20. Then there's the great and bold, courageous, faithful prophet Nathan who did not accept David in the mess he had gotten himself into. After David's sins, this stalwart, stern prophet, faithful to God at all costs, showed David just how reprehensible was the act that he had committed. And you know, because he was willing to do that, he brought forth one of the greatest changes in the lives of the heroes of all the Old Testament. But it was because he had the courage to stand up there and tell a story that put guilt right where it belonged on David. And then when David passed judgment on what ought to be done, the prophet said, the sermon's all about you. You're the man. We have a view that almost says, preach your sermons and get the truth across, but don't make any one person think that it's aimed at that person, and that one person needs to change. Where did we learn it? No wonder the churches of Christ are struggling and splintered, and everything in the world goes on. We've given up ourselves all too often among the brethren, standing for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If we don't watch out, we'll simply fall into the category of I like you and you like me, and let's keep it that way regardless of what we do elsewhere and with whoever it may be. Nathan could have well had the same attitude and written the same thing the great apostle Paul did. When he asked the Galatians, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And the answer to that is you certainly have. <laughs> we don't want the truth all too often. And there are plenty of preachers out there that do not want to say it where it makes a difference with the people that hear it. The forerunner of the Christ to the Jews, what we know as John the Baptizer, certainly did not accept people as they were. God didn't expect him to. That's the reason he was sent, to be the forerunner of the Christ. He cried out to those people, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet or suitable for repentance. Matthew 3, 7 and 8. Also, he didn't accept King Herod as he was. For he was living in adultery. Thus he was with a woman, his brother Philip's wife, that he had no scriptural right to live with. The Scripture records in Matthew 14, 4, For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. Now try that one on in our society. In view of the state marriage in the home is in today, and you'll just about have to preach it to everybody you seek to convert. Not only that, a host of people are living without being married. They're just thumbing their nose. The fact that marriage is from God for the good of man only when it's carried out as God and the Word of God teaches it should be. There's a whole lot of it's not lawful for thee to have her that needs to be preached today. Well, of course, you say, yeah, he got his head chopped off. Better our heads removed as his was for the reason it was than to keep our heads on our shoulders and march right on to torment. Of course, the whole thing started, started up a big hornet's nest at the truth that was spoken, and that's what we try to avoid. 
a lot of soft soaping compromisers want to preserve all of the ungodly, illicit relationships that people, by their own choice, are enmeshed in and say, well, you must accept people as they are. Why? Where do you get the right to tell me, as I'm a servant of God, that I must accept people the way they are? Will Jesus accept people the way they are? If my memory serves me correctly in the plan of salvation, after having believed correctly in the Christ, the very next step is repentance, Acts 17.30. And it's a command that people repent, or they cannot become Christians. The confession of their faith in Christ won't make any difference if they don't repent. And certainly their baptism is nothing if they do not repent. Let us learn to accept people on the terms that God set out in His Word. And let us in the church have the fellowship that God expects the redeemed of the ages and the faithful to have on the same terms the New Testament sets out. Why would we be content with anything else? Our Lord demanded that men change. We talked about this last week in the matter of conversion, or a new creature in Christ. The words of our Lord clearly show that He did not accept people as they were. To the religious leaders of His day who thought they were the best there could be on service to God, here's what He said to them. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! Well, that's the same loving Savior that said, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. But He said to different groups the things that each group needed to hear. And those that needed to hear, Consider the lilies, so they wouldn't be anxious about where they get things, did not need to hear, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, and vice versa. Our Lord accused them of shutting up God's kingdom against men. He accused them of devouring widows' houses, of making pretentious prayers, of overlooking the weightier matters of the law of Moses, of putting on a big outward show. And he says they were like whited sepulchers that are clean and white on the outside, but inside they're full of corruption and dead men's bones. He concluded by saying this, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 23, verse 33. Now that was all said to religious people, folks. That was all said to the folks who <coughs> considered themselves and who God chose to be His people from which Christ, according to the flesh, would come. But they didn't live like the law of Moses said. Their heart was not right with God. Our Lord didn't accept them, and He was not too overly concerned about tact and diplomacy. If you look at the Lord very closely, we call Him, and rightly so, the Master Teacher. You will see that He was interested in this. First, foremost, and always, getting the truth to the person that the person needs so he'll see his sins and repent of it. We lose sight of that. And Luke 13, 3 and 5, talking about the people in general, lest we think that he only dealt with the most vile and degenerate characters in the way the Scriptures say that he did. He said, Of all people, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I'd just like to follow him around for a while. Jesus came into the world because people could not be accepted of God as they were and as they are. The church of the living God needs to know this. And if we forget it, we will not be the church of God for very long. Because we'll just go right on out into religions that are built upon the commandments and doctrines of men. Paul said this of himself in the way that he lived before he became a Christian. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 1 Timothy 1.15 Paul admitted that he had been a blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious to the cause of Christ, to the Lord's church. He had to turn from all of that and be for everything he once was against. 
Surely he knew he was not to be accepted as he was. Again, I emphasize, men must be changed. And the only one that can do that kind of changing is the person that needs to be changed. Our free moral agency means that I can either choose the right way or the wrong way. I can choose to learn the right way. I can then reject it. Or I can choose the wrong way and love the wrong way because it suits me just fine. And I'm not going to hear anything that goes against the way I'm living, what I want to do. Of the Ephesian saints, the Apostle Paul stated, talking about the time before they were Christians, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2, 12-13. Well now, since the blood Jesus shed on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins, is that which remits sins, but it's not applied until one is baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, then it's obvious these that obeyed the gospel in believing in Christ, repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in Him, and being baptized into the death of Christ where He shed His blood. Thus the blood was applied. Thus their sins were forgiven. That's why, as we pointed out last week, you're then raised to walk in newness of life. A new creature. Where? In Christ. And so that's what he says here. Having no hope without God in the world, but now, as I write this letter, Paul could say, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes are far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. They could not be accepted as they were. But Christ's blood changed all that, but they had to will to learn the gospel. God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. They had to will to comply with it. They were accepted of God only. Only in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1 and verse 6. And the doorway into Christ is to be baptized into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27. There is no other doorway. There may be a host of pious, unbaptized people out there. They may do all sorts of things to help other people every day, but they're outside of Christ. They don't have forgiveness of sins. Thus, all this that they do that's good when they stand before the Lord in judgment, as we discussed this morning, will not be put down as a credit to them. That's why when you see some pictured by our Lord Himself, as we study this morning, saying, Lord, haven't we not done this, that, and the other in Thy name? Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And why would that happen? Because they did not do what the Bible said in the way the Bible said and for the reason the Bible said it. It's that simple. That's how you know you fully complied with any commandment God's ever given you. Is first of all, be sure it's directed to you. Then do what he said the way he said it for the reason he said it. That's how you obey a command of God. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul listed fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, thieves, drunkenness, drunkards, covetous, revilers, extortioners, and others. He said, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't you think if we're to preach the gospel to our land, we must preach the same thing? Don't you think he expected the church at Corinth and any congregation of God's people in the first century in that decadent, loose world to preach that to people in the process of telling them about the forgiveness of their sins? They had to know what sin was in the first place. You can't get a person to repent of sin they know what sin is. That means they don't even know they violated it. Look at the people around about you that are in sin right now. And they're just as happy as a dead pig at a peach orchard. They're just as ignorant as they can be. Dead to anything. They're not bothered. It's up to us to bother them. Oh, but that's unloving. All right, let them go to hell. That's really loving, isn't it? Well, they may not obey anyway. You're giving them the opportunity. That's up to them then. And that's part of our work in the church in preaching the gospel to every creature. Notice what he said further in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Because he added this, that list I just gave. 
And such were. That means past tense used to be not now. And such were some of you. Some of the members of the Lord's church at Corinth had this kind of background. What was it? Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, thieves, drunkards, covetous, revilers, extortioners. Even mentions effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind. That's homosexuals. But he says, you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What do you think those people had to confront in their own mind and life when the gospel was preached to them? How would they know that it's wrong to be a homosexual, that God loves you and He cares for you, and so do God's people, but you can't go to heaven that way? The same of adulterers and fornicators and thieves. Reprobates and moral degenerates could not have been accepted without a change, a big change. It's called repentance. But they did change. And Paul addressed them as sanctified in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. The same gospel that met that decadent, loose world of the Roman Empire and turned many things around will do the same thing today. It's just that we don't have a lot of churches and a bunch of goofhead elders with a bunch of silly preachers wanting their salary. And they're not about to say that. They got too many of them in the congregation to pay for that big building. And they're not going to say it. They're just as worldly as they can be. They'll sit and talk about the Pharisees, scribes, and so forth. Oh, they'll agree that they're hypocrites and whatever else. But they're just like them. They're the same thing. Material matters mean more than anything else. We don't want to disturb the status quo. It's like the old fellow said one time. He said, what are you doing? He says, well, I've been sitting here rocking in my chair by the fire. And he died and had his funeral. And they said, I guess he is now rocking his chair in the fire. These folks were not accepted until they had changed. Neither should the body of Christ today accept them. In the same chapter, the apostle Peter said of them, Seeing ye have purified your souls. Well, how'd they do that? By obeying the truth. Verse 22. It still works the same way. It'll never work any other way. It is preaching the gospel. It is causing people to see themselves as God sees them, not as they've warped their thinking to see themselves. What about the Christian's disposition of mind or attitude toward the world? Well, first of all, the Christian is solemnly warned against the acceptance of worldliness. Today, that's needed in the church as much as anything I can think of. Every way you turn when you leave this auditorium, you'll be looking worldliness right in the eye, and the devil will be looking back through it at you, saying, I'm after you. I wish we could think about the devil literally as the supernatural being he is, and he is after me. He's on my trail. He's right behind me. Some of you have hunted. Some of you may have used dogs and hunt rabbits or some other kind of thing. And you go out there and the hunting dog that's trained begins to sniff, sniff, sniff looking for the rabbit's trail or some other squirrel trail or something, deer trail. And he's capable and he's trained and he trails him right up until finally, we call it, he jumps the animal and then the race is on and he won't give up. How many of us think about Satan doing this the same way? Because he is. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, goeth about seeking, diligent, search, or patient inquiry, seeking whom he may devour. John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2, 15. Now, he wrote that to Christians, folks. It doesn't mean you have to love immoral things it just means you're attached to the affairs of this present world to the point where the kingdom of the lord is put second place god won't accept second place surely we are not to accept that which is opposed to god paul wrote to christians in rome romans 12 and verse 2 that they had a responsibility that you do and i do and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. None should know better than the Christian that a change is mandatory. So the followers of Christ are told this, that ye put off concerning the former manner of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It starts in the heart, folks. It starts in the attitude. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. When someone rises from the watery grave of baptism, a babe in Christ, a new creature in Christ, there must be the resolve in that person's mind to press on in studying more and more to learn greater and greater things in the Bible with the resolve to remove oneself from anything in this world that handicaps him from serving God. The old man must die, and a new man in Christ is then accepted by the Lord. And that goes on all your life in the church. That's what it means to be faithful that's what it means to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It's not proper for one who has been raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 4, to continue the habitual purposeful act of living in sin. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Here's my responsibility. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. I think sometimes we think set your affections on things above means you sit there and contemplate Christ coming on a cloud and little angels fluttering around. No, setting your affections on things above is that you set your affections on the will of heaven that you're to put into practice, that you study and know when you study the New Testament. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. We change, and the only way you can do it, into the image of Christ in order to be accepted by Him. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Thus we are told, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5 and 11. Now, as I said earlier, uh, we may not extend fellowship or buddy up real close with people of the world, but rarely do we say, you're wrong, here's the right way. That'd draw too much attention to us. That would kind of work the other way, but that's not the end of the story to say, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. The next part of it is, but rather reprove them. Show them it's not right. We are neither to accept nor condone that which is sinful and degenerate. Folks, we need this more today if the church of our Lord to remain on this earth like it ought to, like God wants it to, or we'll see people just gradually saying, well, you just have to accept people the way they are. An ever-increasing tirade is directed against uncompromising preachers and elders who oversee the church like God said it over, ought to be. And the reason why is because they will not accept religious teachers as they are. They will not accept members to be worldly. They will not accept members to do as they please. But that is one thing that is not forcefully taught, but it must be. It was Paul who wrote, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Galatians 1 and verse 9. You know the way a lot of people read this? If any man preach any other gospel, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized in you, let him be accursed. But the gospel here means the whole New Testament system. It covers being converted to Christ and everything pertaining to each individual Christian's living and the church and its work organization and worship. It's not just becoming a Christian. That's not exactly uh, fraternizing with false teachers, is it? John said, and we close the lesson out with this, and you notice I've given you nothing you don't know if you're familiar with gospel preacher, preaching. It's just that it's all too easy to see it in a certain light and not see it in actually what it is in its applications because we're too busy saying, oh yeah, that got old Uncle Fufu over here, and it slapped Aunt Sally, and it got the church down the street, when really it, these 
lessons and these chapters and these verses and these books were written to members of the church. So John says, Whosoever transgresseth, the American Standard Version 1901 says, goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, then neither receive him into your house or bidding God speed. For he that biddeth in God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. 2 John 9 through 11. You can tell a person that's wrong. That's sin. You keep doing that, you're going to lose your soul. And then go ahead and just chum up with him like there's nothing wrong. And you're just like him, God says. You're just as guilty as he is. You know, our, our laws, if you're driving a car and you are the getaway man, you don't have to go in the bank and rob it. Just be there for the robbers as they come out, and you're going to suffer the same consequences they did. Now, you can stand there before the judge, and your lawyer can say all he wants to about, well, he stayed in the car. He didn't go in that bank and actually pull a pistol and say, give me your money or I'll shoot you. He's just there in the car. How can you hold him guilty for it? <coughs> because he was willing and able, and he chose to be there to help them in the very act that they did. Why do we think God would be any different when ungodly men can see that? Let us be very careful. Let us renew our minds. Let us realize the state in which we're living. It's not 1900. It's not even 1950. The ground on which the seed, the Word of God is sown, Luke 8, 11, is far less good to receive the seed believe it and obey it, than it was even 25 years ago. We've got to be the church in the here and now, but we've got to be the church without changing. We've got to be the church saying we're going to remain like the New Testament of Jesus Christ that will judge us all in the last day. It says we ought to remain. And whatever we need to change in our lives, we have to do the changing. Because God will not receive us as we are when as we are is in sin. You're not a child of God this afternoon. We've taught the plan of salvation. I hope you realize repentance is far more than saying I'm sorry. It certainly includes that, but it means a radical change from your inward man out, from going the way of the world to the way of Christ. As a child of God, you need to think about where you're going to be tomorrow if time goes on, how you're going to live around the people you're around, what you're going to say to be a light to the world, the salt of the earth, the leavening for good, you need to think about that because it's not just on the preacher and elders. Every member of the church is a contender for the faith and a preacher of the gospel according to their several abilities. And we need to use it. If you need to repent of sins, come confessing them, and God will hear in your prayer forgiveness, and He'll forgive. It's a wonderful thing to preach a sermon and know that the hand of God is still outstretched to receive anybody who is willing from the heart to obey the truth and put him on the road to heaven. You have to be honest, and I have to be honest, all the days of our life on this earth, to say, are we doing that? Or have we let the world slip in? And we say, well, God will accept me. He'll accept me as I am. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation? If so, please come while we stand and sing.